Good evening. My name is Hayden Scott. I am a lead instructor for EMS University San Antonio. I am currently an EMT Intermediate or Advanced EMT as some of you may know it. Today we're going to be going over basic pharmacology as it pertains to an EMT basic. First we got to begin with pharmacokinetics. This is the study of the movement of drugs in the body. It starts with absorption then moves through distribution around the body, then metabolism, and then excretion, or the drug's way out of the body. There are various routes of administration, some of which you are capable of doing, others only your advanced level partner can do. The advanced level routes of administration are intravenous, intramuscular, subcutaneous, transdermal, and intraosseous. However, the routes of administration that you can uh, use as per protocol only are sublingual, oral, and inhalation. Before you administer any medications, you have to have the five rights. Right patient, right route, right dose, right time, and right drug. The right patient, obvious. Always make sure your patient is who they say they are. If they've got a hospital identifier on, like a bracelet, always make sure that the bracelet matches the medication you're about to give. The right route, some medications are only able to be administered via one route. Make sure you're about to give this medication via the right route. The right dose is imperative. You cannot give too little or too much of a medication. You could cause severe adverse reactions, if not cardiac arrest. Always double and triple check the dose you are about to give via the, against the dose prescribed. Right time, make sure you're giving the medication within an, uh, a decent amount of time between other medications that could counteract. The right drug, always double check, triple check the medication you're giving. Some medications names are only different by one or two letters. Always make sure you've got the right medication. Before every administration, Know your protocol. Know what you, as an EMT basic, are able to give and not to give. Check for allergies. What medications are your patients allergic to? Confirm the order. Either confirm what's written in protocol or what's written down by the physician that gave you the order for medication. Check the drug, check the name, check the concentration, check to make sure it's not expired, check to make sure there's nothing floating around in it. Always use aseptic technique. Always wear gloves, make sure the area you're working in is clean, make sure the medication goes into a clean container. If it's a, a pill, Make sure it goes either into a gloved hand or into your patient's hand. If it is albuterol for a nebulizer, always make sure it goes straight from the vial into the nebulizer. Talk to the patient. Communication is key. Let them know what medication you're giving them, why you're giving it to them, what side effects they may feel. Tell them that to let you know as soon as they start feeling one of these side effects or if they start feeling quote unquote funny. Always record the effects of administration. Are they anxious? Do they all of a sudden have tachycardia, bradycardia? Are they hypotensive? Did they go pale or dizzy? Did they lose consciousness? Document everything. Your drugs that you are able to administer as an EMT basic are aspirin, epinephrine via auto-injector only, or EpiPen, oral glucose, 
nitroglycerin, inhalers, activated charcoal, and oxygen. Aspirin is a fibrinolytic. This means it doesn't break up formed clots, but it prevents existing clots from getting worse or future clots from even forming. The standard dose is 81 milligram baby aspirin, four pills total for a grand total of 324 milligrams. Some services carry 325 milligram aspirin. If this is the case, one aspirin is sufficient. Check your protocols versus what you have on hand. Aspirin is indicated for chest pain consistent with cardiac etiology. This means if you feel like their heart's involved, give aspirin. Contraindications for aspirin are an allergy or sensitivity to aspirin or other non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, any type of a bleeding disorder, a bleeding ulcer, signs of a CVA, children and adolescents. Also, another thing to keep in mind, are they taking blood thinners, anything like warfarin or Coumadin? Uh, there are other medications out there that could counteract with aspirin. Again, check your protocols. These will have more detailed contraindications as well as indications and dosing. Oral glucose is a simple sugar supplement that raises blood sugar levels. The dose is 15 grams. Every tube is 15 grams of simple sugar. Uh, these can be uh, obtained at any pharmacy, any drug, drug store. However, in your case, they'll be in your medication bag. Indications are altered mental status or possible diabetic emergency as indicated and verified by a D-stick or AccuCheck. Contraindications for oral glucose are an unresponsive patient and no gag reflex. If your patient doesn't have a gag reflex, they stand the chance of aspiration, which could in turn lead to cardiac arrest. Be very careful. Next we have the EpiPen. The indications for an EpiPen are emergency treatment of anaphylaxis, there are no absolute contraindications for an EpiPen in a life-threatening situation. The EpiPen, however, comes with quite a few side effects. Uh, potentially, they could have tachycardia, anxiety and nervousness, hypertension, headache, pallor, sweating, dizziness, weakness, muscle tremors, nausea, and vomiting. Severe adverse reactions to keep an eye out for are ventricular arrhythmias or angina or myocardial infarction. This is a rare reaction, but it does happen. Always be aware of your patient status. The dosing for EpiPens, uh, for an adult EpiPen, 0.3 milligrams per auto injector. Pediatric, which is 66 pounds or less, 0.15 milligrams per auto injector. Oxygen can be delivered either 10 to 15 liters per minute high flow via non rebreather or 1 to 6 liters per minute via nasal cannula. Depending on your patient's symptoms and status, uh, you will probably potentially use one or both on any given patient. The indication for oxygen administration is hypoxia or the potential for hypoxia, pain or compensation, or a hypoperfusion or the potential for. There are no contraindications for oxygen. When in doubt, give it. Nitroglycerin is a vasodilator. It dilates all the blood vessels, reducing blood pressure as well as lessening the workload on the heart and increasing oxygenation of that cardiac tissue. The dosage for nitroglycerin is 0.4 milligrams sublingual, either one spray or one pill, depending on what your service carries. Medical control authorization is required. You may not be authorized per protocols to administer nitroglycerin. Always be aware of what you are able to do as an EMT basic 
per your protocols. Indications for nitroglycerin are cardiac-related chest pain. In order to give nitroglycerin per protocol, the nitroglycerin must be the patient's prescribed medication. It cannot be somebody else's. It cannot be the nitroglycerin off the rig. If you carry it on hand and you do not have an advanced level partner, you cannot administer nitroglycerin that is in your supply. Contraindications for nitroglycerin are blood pressure less than 100 systolic. They are not the patient's prescribed meds. The patient is showing signs of a CVA or cerebrovascular accident. Or they have taken an erectile dysfunction med. Uh, these include Viagra or Cialis. When you are obtaining a patient's medical history, Always make sure to ask in a chest pain situation if they have taken Viagra or Cialis. Explain to them that it could cost them their life if you give your medication after they've given Viagra after they've taken Viagra or Cialis. Inhalers are fast acting bronchodilators. They reverse bronchospasm and open up lower airways. Inhalers may increase the heart rate depending on what medication is in there. It also provides associated side effects. Inhalers can only be given per order. Medical control authorization, again, is required per local protocol. Inhalers are used for asthma and COPD patients. Again, as with nitroglycerin, it must be the patient's own prescribed medication. You cannot give medication out of your truck supply. It has to be the patient's own prescribed medication. Contraindication for any inhalers, again, they are not the patient's prescribed medication. It is refused by your online medical control. The patient is unresponsive or unable to assist in the uh, inhaler and tachycardia relative to their chief complaint. Next we have activated charcoal. Activated charcoal is an adsorbent. It binds and cocoons the contents of the stomach and prevents absorption of these contents into the bloodstream bloodstream. The dosage for activated charcoal is one gram per kilogram PO or parental weight. Medical control authorization is required per local protocol. Indications for activated charcoal are oral overdose of certain medications and pills. Contraindications for activated charcoal include an unresponsive patient, an absent gag reflex, again, this could potentially cause aspiration. Do not give anything PO to a patient that is unresponsive or has no gag reflex. Online medical cons uh, control refusal. Uh, certain medications contraindicate activated charcoal. Uh, and then intake greater than one hour prior to the administration administration of activated charcoal. This means if they overdosed one hour prior, more than one hour prior to administration, activated charcoal should not be given. We're going to continue on to IV monitoring. The purpose of IVs in the pre-hospital setting is a route for medication as well as fluids. IV monitoring scope EMTs can monitor IVs only doing an, during an interfacility transport, meaning you are going from one hospital to another. The patient must be hemodynamically stable, and the IV cannot have any added vitamins, minerals, or drugs. Types of IV fluid include 0.9% sodium chloride, otherwise known as normal saline, Lactated ringers, D5W, which is a 5% dextrous in water concentration, or any combination of the above. The standard IV catheters that you're going to come across in the field 
are 18 gauge is the standard medical size for adults. Your trauma patients will have a 14 or a 16 gauge. Elderly and pediatric patients will have either a 22 or a 20 gauge. Sometimes in the event of an infant or a neonate, you will have a 24 gauge IV established. These are rare in the pre-hospital setting and usually those patients will be dealt with by an advanced level partner. Some EMTs have specialized training in initiating peripheral IVs and phlebotomy. Most can transport basic crystalloid solutions at a TKO or to keep open rate if initiated at a healthcare facility. Crystalloids via peripheral IV are, again, normal saline, D5W, or lactated ringers. Any capped peripheral IV, otherwise known as a saline lock or a HEP lock, initiated at a healthcare facility can be transported by the basic, no matter what. There are different types of IV tubing. The different types are differentiated by their drop sizes. Blood tubing is known as macro tubing. Adult tubing is not often used in pre-hospital setting. The adult tubing will usually be on your patient's cup going between uh, facilities. Your pediatric tubing is also known as micro tubing. Each tubing has a different drop factor. The tubing drops factor reflects the number of drops per ml or cc. The drop factor for blood tubing is 10 drops per cc. Adult tubing will be either 10, 15, or 20 drops per ml or cc. And pediatric tubing is 60 drops per cc. IV flow rate calculations. In order to perform a calculation, you have to have three pieces of information. The ordered rate, the drop factor of the tubing, and the minutes over which the medication will be administered. The result will be the number of drops per minute. An example, you are ordered to monitor an IV of D5W at 125 cc's per hour with pediatric tubing. So you have 125 cc's times 60 drops divided by one hour which you'll need to convert to 60 minutes. This will give you a total of 125 drops per minute. This will be the flow rate at which you need to set the IV. Next, we'll look at assessing for infiltration. You'll want to assess whether the patient is having pain around the IV site. Do you notice any redness or swelling? If necessary and if able to do so per protocol, flush the IV site as a last resort using a 3cc syringe, nothing larger. Any questions, comments, or concerns can be directed towards your instructor of record. This concludes the basic pharmacology portion of the class. Uh, good luck and good night.